Good evening, everyone. I'm Yusuf Hashmi from Team Taxman, and I welcome you all to today's live webinar, The Role of Constitutional Courts in Protecting the Rights of Taxpayers under the Income Tax Act. But before we proceed, I shall take this opportunity to briefly introduce Taxman. We are India's leading publisher of tax and corporate laws, committed to delivering our users the most authentic and enriching experience. Our goal is to simplify the research and compliance for the legal community. Our unwavering dedication to our vision has driven us to work tirelessly over the past six decades, providing innovative solutions that help our clients grow their tax practice and achieve new heights. We have also developed and maintained the national website of the Income Tax Department with the assistance of our skilled tech team and editorial. And now, everyone, please welcome our esteemed speaker, Mr. Tushar Himan. He specializes in direct and indirect taxation, corporate, commercial, and fiscal laws. He is known for representing clients before various judicial forums, including the Supreme Court. Notably, he was among the youngest in the bar to be conferred senior designation by the Gujarat High Court in 2019. Besides his practice, Tushar holds significant roles in tax and legal associations, speaks at conferences, and contributes to professional journals. He also serves as a visiting faculty at renowned educational institutions, sharing expertise in taxation and corporate law. Welcome, Mr. Himani. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Before we begin, here are a few tips for the audience. Your mic will be on mute during the session. However, you can post your queries in the chat box provided. The speaker will answer your queries either during or after the session. A copy of this presentation will be sent to you via email. So without further ado, I would request Mr. Himani to take it away. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, friends. The topic for today's discussion, namely the roles of the Constitutional Court, am I audible properly? The roles of the Constitutional Court, insofar as Income Tax Act is concerned, friends. If you are practicing the taxes and laws, more often than not, you would have realized certain helpless situations. A situation where someone is acting completely contrary to the provisions of the law. Someone is overstepping the jurisdiction. Someone is taking an action which is not contemplated under the law. Or officer is simply not hearing or giving necessary relief to your clients. And those are the situations when you realize that there must be a remedy other than under provided under the Income Tax Act. And those are the remedies which are provided by way of our constitution. So before we start, let us look at the basic provisions of the constitution, wherein this aspect as regards the levy of taxes is flowing. Because we all know that in India, we have a jurisprudence which is governed by the constitution and that includes even the tax laws also. So not a single penny of tax can be collected without authority of law. So if we have to start, we have to start with Article 265. Article 265 of constitution says that no tax shall be levied or collected except by authority of law. What does it mean? It means that we need tax laws and tax laws which are comprehensive tax laws. So both the levy of taxes and the collection of the taxes should be governed by some law, bylaws, rules, regulations. Unless that is provided for, no tax can be levied or collected. So what are those laws? Laws are enacted under Article 246. Article 246 broadly takes care of three kinds of laws. One is known as the union laws. Income tax falls under list one, that is union list, entry 82, wherein there is a provision for the purpose of enactment and collection of income tax. 
246 also deals with uh, state levies, that is list two, and there are certain levies which are concurrent levies where both state as well as union has the uh, right to enact and collect and uh, administer the tax laws. But frankly, we are today we are not concerned with those laws and those that discussion. We are only concerned with list one, that is union list, more particularly entry 82, which says the taxes on income other than agricultural income. So we are today focusing mainly on the Income Tax Act and the issues for constitutional courts insofar as implementation and administration of income tax laws are concerned. Friends, for any taxation system to work, broadly there are four parameters. The first is subject of tax. That is, what is the subject? Subject is income. Income and the taxes which can be levied on the income, including which are in the nature of uh, profit tax, income tax. At times you find that, sir, we are talking about income. However, many presumptive taxes and schemes take into consideration the turnover and not the income, whether therefore they are validly levied or we can say that, sir, those are not the taxes on income and therefore they are constitutionally not valid. Before we proceed further, let me pause here for a moment and answer that question right away. In fact, at a later stage, probably we would be spending some more time in uh, when we discuss the constitutionality of a particular provision. But today, uh, at this stage, suffice it to say that whenever under the presumptive scheme, taxes are levied based on the gross receipts, there is an element of estimation of income embedded into such gross receipts. And the taxes are always levied on that income component and not on the gross receipts, except provisions of section 68 and 69, where the scheme works in a slightly different manner, read with 115 BBE, where the taxes are levied on the gross credits without there being any income element embedded into the same. However, the, those are presumptive taxes and scheme, wherein the law presumes that whatever credits that you have in the books shall be treated as your income. So the first component is subject of tax, which is income. Second is person liable to pay tax. So those who are liable to pay taxes are the persons who are earning income above a particular threshold limit or who are earning income other than the agricultural income. Rate of taxation, the rate is uh, we have the slave rates up to a particular amount, no taxes, and then it progressively goes on increasing. And the last is measure or value on which the rate is to be applied. That is the assessable income on which you have to pay the taxes. These are broadly the four components based on which the entire taxation system in India works. Before we again proceed further, let us look at two definitions, again, which are flowing from the Constitution of India. Article 366 definition, subclause 28 defines what is taxation. Taxation includes the imposition of any tax or impost, whether general or local or special, and the tax shall be construed accordingly. So taxation includes imposition of any tax. And what is tax on income? Clause 29 defines tax on income to mean a tax in the nature of excess profit tax. It is an inclusive definition. However, what flows from the definition is that it has to be a tax on income. So what we have to remember is that when we are talking about income tax, it has to be on income and income alone. This is insofar as basic structure is concerned. We know that Constitution Article 265 says that taxes can only be levied with the authority of law. Now that authority is uh, defined under Article 246, read with entry 82. With that in mind, the present Income Tax Act is enacted. Therefore, the Income Tax Act is nothing but a child of a constitution. In fact, in India, all the acts are there because of the constitution. And therefore, when we look at the constitutional courts, they are in a way the guardian angels insofar as the implementation of Income Tax Act is concerned. And therefore, we have to look at the roles of the constitutional courts. In India, we have two kinds of constitutional courts. One is the state level that is known as high courts. And second is a federal court that is the apex court, namely the Supreme Court. So these two courts are 
known as the constitutional courts none of the other courts can be termed as constitutional courts because they are not defined under the constitution in fact constitution empowers the setting up of let's say a lower first class magistrates courts or a, a city civil court however those courts are not known as the constitutional courts because there the judges etc are not appointed as per the constitution now what is the role in india unfortunately uh, why i say unfortunately is because that creates lot of volume before these courts unfortunately we have a structure whereby the constitutional court they handle both works uh, namely the appellate work as well as the constitutional work so there are provisions wherein appeal is provided which lie before the constitutional court namely under even under the income tax act section 260 capital a says that appeal against the order of the tribunal can be filed before the high court respective territorial high court whereas against the order of the high court there is a further appeal which is provided before the supreme court therefore they are on one hand they assume the role of an appellate court at the same time they are also the constitutional courts and what is a constitutional court whenever we want to challenge the constitutionality of a particular action in action law notification laws bylaws we go before the constitutional court and allege or ever that this particular provision is ultra virus that is not as per the scheme of the constitution and therefore the constitutional validity can only be challenged before a constitutional court in a constitutional court in india has a dual role appellate as well as constitutional there is no overlapping as i'll point out that the role is very well in a separate watertight compartments there is absolutely no overlapping however the body remains the same the judges remains the same and therefore the courts are always having full dockets they have huge amount of work pending before them second part is that constitutional courts can be approached directly whenever we find that there is no alternative efficacious remedy let us understand the concept of alternative efficacious remedy the constitutional courts as i have pointed out they handle the constitutionality aspect of a particular matter so if a particular order a notice or an action is otherwise challengeable by way of filing appropriate appeal as provided under the respective statutes we are concerned today with only income tax act therefore i'll restrict only to the income tax act so supposing an assessment order is there which is framed under 1433 a scrutiny assessment now that assessment order can be further challenged taken into appeal by way of appeal which is provided under section 246 capital a and now 246 also so that appeal is provided against the order and therefore it is known as an alternate remedy what is an alternate remedy alternate remedy is when a statutory right to appeal is provided or a mechanism where a dispute resolution mechanism is provided under the scheme of the act that is known as alternative remedy and therefore obviously the second question is that under the income tax act every action every order can be taken into revision by an ssc under section 264 whenever an ssc is aggrieved by any order in any manner whatsoever ssc can take those orders into revision under section 264 and therefore can someone argue that sir for every order there is an alternative remedy and that alternate remedy is by way of filing a revision application before the commissioner and therefore you can never approach a constitutional court because constitutional court would say that you go and approach commissioner under 264 in my humble opinion that is not the correct position of law alternative remedy meant or the test of alternative remedy is that there must be an inherent right to appeal 264 is a discretionary remedy the moment we are left to the discretionary remedy at the mercy of the commissioner in many cases he exercises the discretion many cases he does not and there are no set criterias whereby he can be compelled to exercise the discretion 
that cannot be treated as an alternative remedy. Alternative remedy in a simple term must be a right, a inherent right of appeal, which is which must be flowing from the Income Tax Act. So this is a right, which is an alternative right. And therefore, courts would be justified in saying that, sir, you have a right to appeal and therefore do not come here. This is not the right forum. You go and take your assessment order into further appeal. So that is known as alternative appeal. So whenever there is an alternative remedy which is provided, can court refuse the, alter, the, the direct remedy insofar as filing of writ is concerned? There again, there is a distinction between alternative remedy and alternative efficacious remedy. What is efficacious? Efficacious is effective remedy in, in nutshell. Efficacious is a remedy which is a true remedy it is not merely an eye wash or merely a paper remedy. If it is an efficacious remedy, then certainly constitutional courts would be justified in throwing you out by not entertaining your writ petition. However, if it is only an alternate remedy, not very effective, it's a long drawn process of appeal or there are issues which are outrightly without jurisdiction, which have violated the principles of natural justice, or there are jurisdictional issues, or there is, there is a challenge to the virus, then those are the issues which can never be taken into appeal. And therefore, the constitutional court would be happy to entertain your rate application insofar as those kinds of cases are concerned. That said, constitutional authority, that is the constitutional courts, they also play a supervisory role insofar as maintenance of rule of law in their territorial jurisdiction is concerned. So if a Delhi High Court is sitting in Delhi, then that High Court has a territorial jurisdiction over the state of Delhi. And if at all any deficiency on the part of the assessing authority or any other authority insofar as uh, performing their duties are concerned, then the High Court, territorial High Court would be playing the supervisory role. And in that context also, constitutional courts can be approached. Again, the constitutional courts are there to check the abuse of power. If some authority is not providing you with the necessary relief, they are abusing the power. Supposing there is a search which takes place at your premises, the search authority simply puts a lock that is a prohibitory order on three of your bedrooms and they do not re return back to the search premises for months together. That is abuse of power because they are not concluding the search for some reasons best known to them, some ulterior motive. And therefore, one can, in that scenario, challenge that abuse of power directly before the constitutional court by pointing out that, sir, in the search, my bedroom is locked since last three months. They are not opening the bedroom and not concluding the search. And therefore, this is nothing but abuse of power. In that scenario, the authorities will have to justify the action as to why a particular bedroom is under lock and key for more than three months. Now, these are the roles which a constitutional court is playing. And therefore, when we summarize, when we end this discussion, I'll also point out that why this, this dual role and large number of rates are clogging the system or the dockets of the constitutional courts. And therefore, they are finding it extremely difficult to deal with the work which they are otherwise required to do, except for handling these matters in a very cursory and admission stage. They are not in a position to devote any time to uh, take the cause of justice any further. Let me then move to the next part as to once we know that taxes can be collected only with the authority of law, once we know that constitutional courts are there to safeguard the interest of a taxpayer, then the next question is, sir, what can be challenged before the constitutional court? What can be challenged is, uh, a virus of a provision, if you believe that a particular provision, virus thereof, is unconstitutional, it is ultra virus, it is beyond the legislative competence, then you can challenge a particular act, particular rule, particular notification, a particular circular, because notification, circular are all the byproduct of the delegation of the legislative function. What the parliament has done is, Parliament would enact the main provisions. The Income Tax Act per se is enacted by Parliament. Simultaneously, they also realize that there are a large number of administrative and operational functions 
for which they cannot devote time and therefore they delegate that power to legislate further under section 119 of the act under section 119 of the act the parliament has delegated some legislative power to cbdt and other such bodies where the authorities can come out with notifications come out with uh, certain bylaws certain instructions certain circulars which ultimately help the income tax authorities in administrating the law in a better manner so this is known as delegated function of legislation now this delegation can also be challenged if one feels that that power is not used properly or the delegates are acting in a way which is beyond their competence beyond their legislative powers the second part is that where the orders where there is no appeal which is provided we'll discuss that in in length that which are those orders when there is no appeal which is provided those orders can be challenged straight away before the high, high court by way of filing a writ petition the third part is that when any action or inaction order direction notice that is issued without jurisdiction that is illegal against express provisions of law or simply invalid those things can further be challenged by way of filing a writ petition before the high court so these are uh, the actions which are otherwise dwelling which are otherwise on a thin line where one can say that sir this aspects can also be raised by way of filing any appeal and therefore this category of challenge before the high court you will have to cross the hurdle of alternate remedy which i have discussed few minutes back then the next part is you can challenge an action in action order direction notice etc which are issued in breach of principles of natural justice this is the most common challenge which one comes across that the principles of natural justice again i'll discuss what are the principles of natural justice and how they can be pressed into service once you believe that a particular action is in breach of natural justice you can challenge those actions also by way of filing a writ petition and again the maintenance of uh, a rule of law in the territorial jurisdiction that is something which certainly can be challenged before the constitutional court now let us discuss each of this head independently so first is let us deal with the challenge to the virus virus challenge is let me at this stage point out that challenge to a virus that the validity of the constitutionality of a particular provision is always running counter to the petitioner so if you are a petitioner and if you want to challenge the constitutional validity of a particular section then the presumption which runs against you is that the provision in question is constitutionally valid so burden is on the petitioner the ssc the challenger to establish that such a provision is constitutionally invalid and for that there are certain settled norms but again the law is well settled that when it comes to deciding the constitutionality of a particular fiscal statute a great or a greater latitude is given to the parliament and in that context again it is extremely difficult to establish that a particular provision is constitutionally invalid that say under what circumstances the constitutionality of a particular provision can be pressed into service the first part is that a particular law is enacted by parliament if the ssc believes that parliament is not competent to tax a particular item then that law can be said to be beyond the legislative competence so supposing if you believe that a particular act let us take a practical example let's say section 115 bbe read with section 68 it levies a tax at a particularly high rate namely 60 plus 15% so 75% plus surcharge etc so effectively 
and the penalty etc if one adds up then it amounts to almost 83 point something so 115 bbe taxes an ssc on a gross credit basis because supposing a particular credit according to the revenue authority assessing officer is not satisfied about your explanation about that particular credit he would tax you under 115 bbe at the rate of 75% now mind you here though article 246 read with entry 82 it is a tax only on the income here the entire gross receipt under section 68 is a subject matter of tax and that too at a very higher rate then can one argue that sir here the parliament is not competent to tax this item because parliament is only competent to tax me on the income here they are taxing me on the gross receipts where is the element of income and therefore this is beyond the legislative competence one can argue one can develop the case before the uh, court of law that this is beyond the legislative competence revenue department would certainly argue that section 68 is has been in the statute book since last decades a few decades and therefore now challenging section 68 because it is in violation of article 246 read with 265 is probably too late in the day number 1 number 2 here there is a presumption which is running an SA, against an ssc that the gross receipt would be presumed to be the income and therefore once the gross receipts namely the total credit becomes your know, unexplained income in the hands of an ssc the question of finding out the element of income in this gross receipts would not arise and therefore we are competent to legislate take another example let let us look at slight in a slightly different manner let's say a particular amendment or a particular law is introduced by the state legislative assembly a particular state namely let's say state of gujarat came out with a particular law sometime back wherein they decided to pass a law whereby the deep discount bonds issued by one sardar sarovar narmada nigam was to be redeemed before its maturity date so state assembly passed a law whereby they said that in the hands of the sardar sarovar narmada nigam limited which is a limited company these bonds would be redeemed to the individual bond holders before their maturity date and a case came to be filed before the gujarat high court pointing out the legislative competence of the state government because companies act is a union act it's a act which is falling under the union list and therefore it was already preoccupied therefore the state law have become repugnant and therefore to that extent there was no legislative competence in so far as state government is concerned so these are some of the facets of competence to legislate and that is one ground of challenge before a constitutional court the second ground is the fundamental rights which are guaranteed under part 3 of the constitution read with article 13 14 we have a right of equality right of uh, uh, protection against arbitrary action unreasonable action many facially arbitrary actions confiscatory actions and under 191g we have a right to practice any profession or carry on any business trade or occupation without you know, getting uh, any uh, undue restrictions from the state now let us try to understand what is it that is uh, being challenged before the court if supposing if there are there are categories of identically placed taxpayers paying taxes at a differential rates then one can argue that sir there is no equality and therefore this is in violation of article 14 that say again it is well, well accepted that some intelligible differentia is permissible parliament can distinguish between different categories of taxpayer and can tax them at a differential rate in fact the slab system itself is unequal however that has been accepted upheld by the constitutional court by saying that such a slab system by taxing someone up to a particular income at the rate of zero then up to a particular rate at the rate of 5 to 10% then 10 to 20 and then beyond that particular income 30% and more with surcharge 
is a legitimate system it does not violate the touchstone of article 14 namely it is not an inequality it is accepted by the uh, courts that such a system is based on some intelligible differentia some rational distinction between group of taxpayers that is permissible however in the context of 80 hhc there were two categories which was created by the in 2005 by the parliament that exporters having turnover of less than 10 crore and exporters having turnover in excess of 10 crore and based on that different conditions were placed into the statute book so as to give them the benefit of 80 hhc and that amendment was introduced with a retrospective effect in that context, Gujarat High Court ultimately confirmed by the Supreme Court held that such a distinction between two classes of taxpayers, namely someone having turnover of less than 10 crore and about 10 crore is something which is not permissible and such an artificial classification is unequal treatment to identically placed taxpayers not permissible in law. Arbitrary action. What is arbitrary action? Arbitrary action is something which is on the face of it looks arbitrary and unreasonable. In fact, the classic example is a uh, judgment in the case of recent judgment in the case of uh, Pepsi Foods 433 ITR 295, wherein the challenge was to the provision of the law whereby the stay granted by tribunal, the parliament introduced a provision wherein they said that if at all any stay is granted by the tribunal, income tax appellate tribunal, and if the stay granted matter is not heard within a period of six months from the grant of stay, within a period of 180 days, if the matter is not heard, even if the SSC is not at a fault, then also the stay would automatically get vacated. That provision was challenged on the ground of arbitrariness and manifestly arbitrariness. That, sir, what if the bench is not constituted for six months together? Then where is the question of hearing the matter? And therefore, you cannot put a provision and take away the right of stay by introducing something which is completely arbitrary. Supreme Court has ultimately held that this is manifestly arbitrary. And therefore, they said that for no fault of SSE, you cannot have a provision which is worded in such a way that it, it becomes absolutely arbitrary insofar as implementation of the same is concerned. In fact, ultimately, Supreme Court has read down the provision and inserted the word that in case if the SSC is at fault, then the stay get vacated within a period of six months if no hearing takes place. So that would take care of reading down of the provision also, which is uh, uh, the next topic of discussion. Uh, the reasonable restrictions, in fact, section 115 BBE read with section 68 read with uh, the action taken by the department on the ground that during the demonetization period, if at all, if you have made sales, etc., and if that sales is not duly explained, then that would be treated as cash credit under section 68. And that provision is under challenge on the ground that this is an unreasonable restriction on an SSC in carrying out a particular business, namely business of a goldsmith. And therefore, this is in violation of 191G, not permissible. On that ground, the challenge is pending before Honorable the Gujarat High Court. Probably the matter should be taken up for hearing anytime soon. But then a provision which has the effect of uh, preventing someone from carrying out a particular business or a trade or a commercial activity, which has a deterrent effect. And that effect is such that person, an SSE, a citizen would not even carry out the necessary business, underlying business, that would be amounting to unreasonable restrictions, which is not permissible. A retrospective amendment, more particularly in the field of penal provisions, again, can be challenged on the ground that a penal provision cannot have any retrospective effect. It is in violation of Article 20 of the Constitution. And generally, even for the fiscal statute, now we have the judgment of the constitutional bench, 367 ITR 466 uh, in the case of Vatika Township, wherein the view that is taken is that even for the fiscal statute, retrospectivity cannot be presumed unless the parliament comes out with a particular reasoning, with a particular ground that for this reason, this particular section is made retrospectively applicable. The same shall not have any retrospective effect. 
only one exception. If at all a particular provision is beneficial one, then probably retrospectivity cannot be frowned upon. We can have uh, two kinds of simultaneous remedy. One is High Court Article 226. Another is Supreme Court Article 32. My advice is for the fiscal statute, more particularly for income tax, the challenge should be before the High Court rather than rushing straight away to the Supreme Court. In any case, Supreme Court might not entertain you unless you have filed a writ petition under Article 226 before the respective High Court. There are writs we are concerned with mainly mandamus, prohibition and certiorari. Mandamus is directing someone, prohibition is prohibiting the authority and certiorari is again uh, asking the lower court to uh, do particular thing. Uh, basics I have already covered. That would take me to the second part of the uh, discussion. That is what are those unappealable order, which are those orders where there is no provision of appeal, where only writ is maintainable, where one has to file necessarily a writ petition. Uh, supposing your return is belated, you are now not in a position to file the return because your portal is not allowing you to upload the return for a particular year, namely let's say assessment year 1920, time is over, so you can't upload the return on the portal. You write to CBDT under 119 that for ABC reasons, there was no filing of return and you have a reasonable cause according to you. CBDT does not entertain your request under 119. Now, there is no appeal which is provided under 119 for obvious reasons because CBDT is again the su most superior authority in so far as Income Tax Act is concerned and therefore against their order, there cannot be any appeal. Therefore, one can file a writ petition and here one has, one did not have to cross the hurdle of alternate remedy. Second such example is transfer of cases under Act, uh, Section 127. The cases are transferred more often than not local transfers probably no hearing is even granted for transfers which are across the state which are not local then those transfers hearing is necessary if at all it has been done without granting an opportunity of hearing one can challenge the transfer orders many a times because of the search there is a centralization if that happens that centralization happens for uh, effective and coordinated investigation if that is the only reason which is given, one can even think of challenging those orders directly before by filing the writ petition. Validity of the search. Uh, my personal experience is uh, validity of the search. Uh, there are very slim chances of succeeding. However, for some intermediary stages, for some relief, one can challenge the validity of the search. Uh, I have already given an example of uh, PO for an unreasonable long duration. There also one can challenge the action of search 132 capital b release of assets seize assets requisitions etc then 132 subsection 3 prohibitory orders 132 9b that is provisional attachment post search which is again have a very short self life special audit under 142 2a if it is done without granting opportunity of hearing and if it is done only with a view to buy some more time to frame the assessment which was otherwise getting time barred Again, those actions can be challenged. Section 148 AD, read with 148, this notices and the order, again, no provision of any appeal, can straightway be challenged. 179, liability of directors of a private limited company uh, can be challenged. Section 220, rejection of application of stay of demand, 226.3, those are garnishy orders, third party recovery orders. 264, revision order can be challenged. 279, order sanctioning prosecution can also be challenged. If at all, one can show known application of mine. 281 capital B provisional attachment order, no provision of any appeal. One can do that. Uh, any schemes, namely VSV or earlier uh, that uh, uh, tax evasion schemes or where such beneficial schemes government come out from time to time. If at all you are agreed with any of those schemes and implementation thereof, one can file read against those issues. If at all an action is a particularly in violation of the jurisdiction, that is ex facie without jurisdiction, those actions broadly under the four categories, supposing an action is without authority of law. Uh, during the search, supposing uh, in a jeweler's case, when the ornaments, etc. are stock in trade, if those are put under Caesar order, 
then one can challenge that action by pointing out that there is a provision 132 one small roman 3 first proviso which says that the stock in trade cannot be seized in a in a search so therefore that that action is without authority of law supposing your assessment proceedings are going on an assessing officer issues a show cause notice to you and thereafter refuses to accept your uh, reply or closes the window of for filing any reply immediately after issuing the show cause notice then that action is without authority of law that action is therefore without jurisdiction can be straightway challenged territorial jurisdiction supposing a a non jurisdictional assessing officer issues 148 notice then you may point out that sir this is without jurisdiction because the concerned officer is not my assessing officer and only ao can issue 148 notice lack of territorial jurisdiction reopening beyond a period of 10 years without justifiable reasons then expressly illegal it is beyond limitation period therefore one can challenge that action if at all officer who is not an assessing officer passes any order 281b for example again is an order which can only be passed by the assessing officer so provisional attachment put by your recovery officer tax recovery officer cannot be upheld because he is not your assessing officer if you can demonstrate that unless of course 220 222 order is passed and he is made the assessing officer you can challenge that order so these are some of the examples of uh, orders without jurisdiction that would bring me to the most controversial or most uh, sought after provision that is principles of natural justice there is no definition of principles of natural justice in fact natural justice is something which is uh, evolved which has evolved over a period of time uh, with the evolution of the civilization and evolution of uh, uh, normal jurisprudence the principles of natural justice have also evolved and today what we see is that principles of natural justice are almost without there being any explicit provisions they are read with income tax act so what are those principles of natural justice natural justice is audi alteram partum that is no person shall be condemned unheard so if you are not given proper opportunity of hearing then one can challenge that action that sir there was only one notice of hearing and that notice also was not served upon me so effectively i was not granted any opportunity then that action is in violation of principles of natural justice second is uh, that is they they are during the assessment proceedings assessing authority has to give you opportunity of firstly the hearing number 2 ao the officers in question have to issue a particular show cause notice so as to bring out the particular charge against you he has to then give you sufficient opportunity so that you can rebut those charges and ultimately once you file those details on the record he has to pass a reasoned order a order which is a speaking order so as to deal with your contentions any breach at any stage would ultimately amounts to violations of principles of natural justice and that would ultimately lead to the conclusion that the final order whatever is that order at whatever stage would become a nullity illegality or irregularity as the case may be however that said one cannot rush to the court for each and every smallest of the small administrative violations one has to demonstrate before the court that the violation of principles of natural justice was in such a manner that the outcome would have been different had the opportunity been granted then probably outcome would have been different many a times the test is that supposing a third party statement is used against you and you are not granted the opportunity of cross examining that person despite repeated request made to the concern authority the revenue authority would again try to argue that sir that person the third party whose statement is used is a serial offender he is a person who is a habitual entry provider and therefore even if we grant the opportunity of cross examining that person nothing would really turn on that to that supreme court has said that such an action is not justified on the part of the authority they cannot presume the conclusion without granting the opportunity of hearing they cannot say that sir no effective purpose would be served if at all an opportunity is required to be granted it has to be granted that said supposing 
a show cause notice is issued to you you have answered to that show cause notice and once again the very same same show cause notice is issued to you as a final draft order against which you file the very same reply which was not considered by the authority then probably court would not be impressed with your argument that i was not given an opportunity opportunity was granted you have made your submissions the very same submissions are once again filed and if that letter's reference is not there however in substance all your submissions are taken into consideration there is no violation of principles of natural justice i have uh, illustrated some of the situations where the violation can be said to have taken place but we would discuss this uh, uh, probably uh, sometime later because we are running out of time uh, the next issue is as i when i opened i said that rate is maintainable only if there is no alternate remedy and therefore the hurdle of crossing that alternate remedy in each and every case will have to be done by an ssc unless of course uh, it falls under that list which are unappealable orders where rate is as a matter of right you can file the rate and argue the matter on merits however in so far as other orders other notices are concerned where one can argue that alternate remedy is very much available and therefore your rate is not maintainable however over a period of time supreme court has laid down the test that under what circumstances a rate is maintainable and that is probably the latest judgment uh, on the subject is uh, 2021 6SCC 771. Again, it has reiterated the principles laid down in 1998 8SCC 1, the case of Walpur. Uh, the latest judgment is Radha Krishan Industries in the context of Section 83, the provisional attachment under the GST Act, wherein one of the issues which was raised by the revenue was that sir, rate is not maintainable because under 107 of GST Act, there is an appeal which is provided in such an order. Supreme Court has laid down four criteria. Criteria one is that if at all, if you are enforcing, if you are trying to enforce a fundamental right, then your rate is maintainable, whatever may be the circumstances and whatever appeal rights which may accrue in your favor may be there. But despite anything, if at all, it's a question of protection of fundamental rights, enforcement of fundamental rights, then rate is maintainable. Second is breach of principles of natural justice. Third is the action is wholly without jurisdiction. And fourth is, if at all, virus of a legislation is in challenge. We have discussed each of this principle, fundamental rights, natural justice, without jurisdiction actions, and virus of a uh, challenge to the virus of the legislation uh, earlier. Therefore, I'm not dwelling much time on that. But then if you can demonstrate before the constitutional court that, sir, there is a violation of, let's say, an order passed in violation of principles of natural justice. You ask for a few days' time. Though the order was not getting time barred without any replying to your request for adjournment, assessing authority framed the order and sent you the order immediately on email without waiting for your reply. Such an action, if you can demonstrate that it is in violation of principles of natural justice, then you may argue before the court that, sir, this is ultimately a violation of principles of natural justice. My submissions are not taken into consideration. I may not be relegated back to the appellate authority. If I go before the appellate authority, I have to cross the hurdle of filing additional evidences, justifications. Ultimately, additional evidences would also go back to the assessing authority for remand purposes. And I, there is an ex facie illegal order, and I should not be made to suffer because of that illegal order, which is in breach of principles of natural justice. Under such a circumstances, though there is an appellate remedy, but such an appellate remedy is not very efficient. It is not an efficacious remedy. And therefore, court would be justified in entertaining the writ petition. Uh, the most common writ, second number is a uh, challenge to the orders under 148A, D, that is uh, the precursor to issuance of notice under section 148. If at all, notice under 148 is issued, then there is no appeal which is provided under 148 notice neither any appeal is provided under section 148 capital a small d order so both this collectively can be challenged before a constitutional court by filing writ petition if one can point out that the action is ex facie illegal without jurisdiction it lacks validity or it is barred by limitation 
or fundamental conditions which are prescribed under section 148, 147, read with 149, read with 151 are not fulfilled. So if at all any such violation can be demonstrated, then one can straightway challenge the order that is clause D order along with notice before a constitutional court on the ground that sir, this is an illegal notice. If the notice itself is illegal, then whatever reassessment order, which is which can, of course, a subject matter of further appeal, which can be challenged in appeal, and therefore one has a right of challenging reassessment order in appellate proceedings. However, the enabling notice, namely 148, read with clause D order, itself are without jurisdiction. And therefore, it is like a fruits of a poisonous tree. If at all your notice lacks validity, if at all the notice is without jurisdiction illegal, then any reassessment order which is arising as a result of issuance of such notice can again be subject matter of uh, quashing and setting aside by the High Court. That would take me to one more issue and that issue is, can one challenge a Shoko's notice straightway before the High Court on the ground that Shoko's notice itself is without jurisdiction, illegal, without uh, not within falling within the uh, permissible time limit that is barred by limitation. Courts have taken the view that a Shoko's notice straightway cannot be challenged and for justifiable reasons. Look, 148 is 148AD is an order. It is not a Shoko's notice. 148 is a notice which is again based on 148AD. However, to that, supposing I, I want to challenge a Shoko's notice, which is issued to me when my scrutiny assessment is going on, on the ground that there is no jurisdiction available with the assessing authority, and I want to challenge that uh, jurisdictional notice, can I do it? The courts have taken the view that court should be extremely reluctant in entertaining a direct challenge to the Shoko's notice. And therefore, ideally, what one should do is, when one believes that a Shoko's notice is not without, with jurisdiction or illegal, one should file a detailed response, pointing out all sorts of illegality, which according to the SSE are there in the Shoko's notice. Once that response is filed, thereafter that Shoko's notice can be challenged because then the High Court would see that these are the illegalities, these are the issues which authorities are not dealing, and therefore one can thereafter challenge the Shoko's notice. However, uh, more often than not, one would no notice, one would observe that High Court is extremely reluctant in so far as challenge to the Shoko's notice is concerned. And that would take me to the last point on which we can approach the constitutional court and that is rule of law. That if at all the court feels that rule of law is not maintained, then court would certainly give indulgence to that SSC. Supposing you are entitled to a refund, you file the return of income along with refund, your refund is processed under 143.1. You are issued that your refund would be credited in your bank account. That intimation also has come into your email in due course. However, that due course never comes. Then for the purpose of implementing the rule of law, one can approach the court and ask the authorities to release the refund immediately. If the stay is refused on a ground which are not justifiable, then one can say that please grant me the stay of demand and therefore, in order to maintain the rule of law, all these issues, namely the orders which are against the settled position in law, supposing Gujarat High Court has taken a view that uh, in the context of uh, uh, 147, that unless clause B notice and is given or served, duly served on the SSC, no further proceedings can take place. And one, if one can demonstrate that clause B notice under section 148, capital A, has never been solved on the SSC, then such an order is against the settled position in law. Gujarat High Court has already taken a view. Or binding jurisdictional judgments are not being followed. Commissioner of Appeals not following the jurisdictional High Court judgment. Now we have faceless commissioners. But nonetheless, if the SSC is in the state of Gujarat or in the state of Delhi, then those would become the jurisdictional High Courts and those judgments are not followed, then it becomes a question of rule of law transfer of cases, non-disposal of appeals. I file appeal, authority is not taking up my appeal for, for years together. I can file a writ petition compelling the authority to follow the rule of law. 
So any action or inaction for that matter can be challenged when the question is one of rule of law before the constitutional court. With this friends, my one hour is almost getting over, four minutes are left. And I'm told that there would be some question answer in the, at the end. So I'm concluding. In my view, the role of the constitutional court in protecting the interests of the taxpayers is very, very crucial and very material. Many a times we do not even realize that this is a stage where we should approach the constitutional court for appropriate relief. If as a professional brothers, if as a professionals, if we believe or if we are aware that this is the time, this is the stage to approach the constitutional court, then probably that would solve many problems for our SSE clients. And one should take help of the constitutional court whenever one feels that there is some injustice or illegal action is taking place. With these friends, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Jai Hind. Thank you, Mr. Himani, for your outstanding presentation and a clear and concise explanation of the subject matter. We greatly appreciate the effort that you've put into making this session a success. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the participants for their cooperation and contributions. We could not have done it without you. Although we have attempted to address the queries raised during this session, please feel free to send any additional queries in writing to sales at taxman.com. Thank you all again. We look forward to presenting another vital topic to you soon. Until then, Take care and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you.